Australia is a young nation, a teenager. And like most teenagers, Australia is entirely self-obsessed. I have a degree in art history, so I'm incredibly useful to society. I have a particular love of Australian art, and I think by studying it, we can learn a lot about our culture. Our artists have been obsessed with defining what it means to be Australian, and as much as it shits me, you can't talk about Australian art without talking about those dreaded words. Australian national identity. The ethnic, religious and cultural diversity of Australia is impressive. And every single one of us could describe ourselves with a variety of identities. We all know this. Yet there remains this pervasive idea that there's some kind of typical Aussie, some kind of bloke in a hat. So if you're not a white man in a hat, you might struggle to see yourself in the Australian art story. But don't be sad. I believe our art has a lot more to offer than you might think. In this series, I'm going to take a journey from white settlement and into the studios of contemporary artists and shake things up a bit, reinterpret and rediscover. I want to challenge some existing ideas of past and present about who on earth we think we are. I'm going to show you what I see, what I don't see and what I want to see. I'm Hannah Gadsby and this is my Oz. <laughs> Sometimes, when I walk around in a field in inappropriate clothing, feeling my pasty skin burning a slow death, I reckon I feel like Dorothy must have felt in Oz. A bit out of place. I'm not from Kansas, and Oz is the only home I've ever known, so clearly I belong here, right? Actually, I'm from Tasmania. Down under's down under. And yes, Tasmanians know all the jokes. We know that you laugh at our frighteningly small gene pool and assume that we have two heads, but I don't care. I love Tasmania. When I was growing up in Tasmania, it was easy to feel disconnected from the rest of Australia, the rest of the world. But despite this isolation, it still feels like home. Tasmania is where I belong. White Australians have had issues feeling at home since they first stepped ashore. Our sense of belonging has a complex and troubled past, which our art can tell us a lot about. I want to take a look at some colonial art to see just how at home the first white settlers felt in Australia. For the members of the First Fleet, this country must have been a frightening and alien world, a lifetime away from the crowded city streets and green meadows of Blighty. Amongst the sailors and convicts on the First Fleet, there are a few blokes who could draw a bit. And it was these non-professional artists who were tasked with documenting the native flora and fauna. The British were obsessed with the strangeness of their new colony. In fact, that fascination continues today, with most of them openly terrified of the strange creatures from down under. <laughs> Look at that thing! Oh, oh. oh my god! Oh my god! Apart from bafflement, the colonists' other response to the wildlife was hunger. Sidney Parkinson, botanist on board of the Endeavour, wrote, we saw a great number of birds with beautiful plumage We shot a few of them, which were made into a pie, and they ate very well. Many of these first images of wildlife were produced by an artist known as the Port Jackson Painter. Not much is known about the Port Jackson Painter, except that it was more than one person and no one is entirely sure who they were. For me, one of the most interesting aspects of these paintings is that they bear witness to the first contact and negotiation between the white settlers and the indigenous population. But while 
While these images are amongst the most important historical evidence showing first contact, we must remember that witness testimony comes with a lot of subjective baggage. In this case, the British colonisers packed the bags. So how much truth can we read into these images? This is Daniel Boyd. He recently spent three months as an artist in residence at the Natural History Museum in London, where many of the Port Jackson painters' images are held as part of the First Fleet collection. First Fleet collection was to be shown uh, opposite um, my installation that I was making for the museum. And it was kind of like a starting point, so my way into the collection. Dan is interested in challenging the subjectivity and therefore historical accuracy of these artworks. His response was a series called the Up in Smoke Tour. These dotted reimaginings echo that recognisable style of Indigenous painting. The deliberately obscured images reference the cultural genocide of the Aboriginal people the negative space between the dots hinting at the stories lost in the colonisers' version of events. How important is it for you to challenge these visual histories? I think it's re really important, not just for me, it's important for the museum to, to uh, reassess their collection and how they engage with it so that, you know, there's a dialogue. But Dan's Up in Smoke Tour artworks go much further than just questioning the Port Jackson painter. He digs even deeper than that. He gets right to the bones of it and incorporates the museum's collection of human remains. Now, there's a substantial number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders that are still held in the collection. This is a, a box that held an actual human skull in it. On a tour of the conservation department, I discovered that they were rehousing their human remains collection and they were putting them into these new conservation grade boxes. But Boyd has refused to allow the museum to destroy this part of its own story by salvaging the discarded human remains boxes and incorporating them into his installation. This is an artwork that paints directly onto history, a defiant act to preserve the truth of this institution's past. This is not the first time Boyd has challenged Australian history through his art. In this piece, he remixes an Emmanuel Phillips Fox painting. The original was painted during Federation as a celebration of Cook's declaration of British sovereignty in Australia. Boyd's version directly calls into question Cook's authority to do this. Boyd's painting is satisfying in its intelligent subversion and wit, the way that it reminds you that history does reverberate into the present. It's also a reminder that for quite some time, artists were flogging Australia as a piece of prime real estate, ripe for settlement. You look like you need a holiday, a fair dinkum holiday, in the land of wonder, the land down under. The selling of Australia to the rest of the world has invariably involved high levels of embellishment. I'll slip an extra shrimp on the barbie for you. A hundred and fifty years before Hoag's was hired by Tourism Australia to mistake a prawn for a shrimp, Joseph Lycett was hired to create advertising images that would sell Australia as a thriving colony to the folks back home. Lysett is one of my favourite colonial painters. He was a convict, a liar, a cheat, a forger and a bullshit artist. What's not to love? Like many colonial painters, Lysett created fantasy versions of an Australian landscape, editing and omitting details as he saw fit. This could be anywhere in England, but in fact, it's Sugarloaf Mountain in New South Wales. In this painting, Joseph Lysett has lined this lovely park not with eucalypts, but with something that looks a little bit more like English natives. It's a lovely scene of peaceful coexistence with a strolling group of Aboriginal people making their way out of the picture while a pair of settlers stand happily pointing at their immense first homeowner's grant. I'm waving at Joan Ross. 
She's a bit of a forger herself. Hello, Joan. Hi, Hannah. How are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm very well. That is a lovely dress. Oh, thank you. Did you make it yourself? Yes, I did. Well done, you. There must have been uh, a sale on at Lincra. <laughs> yeah. Joan Ross is a multimedia artist who uses large doses of irreverence and humour to challenge and reinterpret the historical perspective seen in colonial art. In this work, which composites a number of Lysett's paintings, she takes the forger completely to task. The main image is a Tasmanian landscape, but he apparently never went to Tasmania. So he was kind of uh, forging the Australian landscape? Definitely. A couple come in, they're on a tartan fluoro magic carpet, I guess. Yeah. And they're representing the original colonisers. They're carrying a designer handbag, a barrel of rum, and they've got slinkies on their head. Why slinkies? Well, because they're a bit crazy. Right. And out of touch a little bit with anything natural, I guess. Ah. And so they land under the group of Aboriginal people? The Aboriginal people have invited them. So this actually is reconfiguring not only the work, but history. Just making it up. I'm just making it up because it actually been. it's all been made up. Oh, controversial. Then there's a rowboat full of high-vis police because once you get that fluoro colour on, you're an authority. You're also an authority over land, traffic. You have, you know, you can rob houses and no one takes any notice of you. Thanks for the tip. At the same time as all this is happening, a blob has been coming down the road and it's a blob of the metaphor of colonisation. It's just a big fluoro blob. Out of this blob explodes colourful symbols, including the smallpox molecule. You know, the one that caused so much devastation amongst the Aboriginal people. But then they turn into fireworks, so everything's OK. Joan's work is full of these fantastic hidden digs. Uh, why lice it? In his landscapes, he would always have a European couple standing on the shore pointing. And as much as I loved his landscape, I was quite disgusted by the Europeans and colonials suggesting ownership of the land. That's mine. See That's that? Mine. That's yep. mine. Let's put a fence up here. So the colonial attitude that we see in those paintings is still apparent today, I see. There's a lot of racism in Australia towards Aboriginal people. And I wanted to make some videos that just shifted this around a little bit and put another view of history because they're just people's views. So Lysett got a pardon, went back to, to England where he started to forge again quite quickly and was arrested. Uh, did he come back to Australia? They were going to send him back, so he decided to cut his throat. Gosh, that's an extreme action. Yeah. So I don't think he, uh, he liked Australia as much as his landscapes suggested. No, I don't think so either. <laughs> so I'm not going to back that hellhole. <laughs> I've seen the paintings. <laughs> Made 150 years after Joseph Lysett's death, and by a Tasmanian in Tasmania, Beer Maddox Terra Spiritus is the first piece of artwork that really challenged my assumption of belonging in Tasmania. The 51 prints that make up Maddox's epic panoramic work depict a literal circumnavigation of the entire coastline of Tasmania, coloured with local ochre. The Latin title means Spirit of the Land. When I first saw this piece, my instinct was to find the panel that corresponded to Smithton, my hometown. The flat line that I saw looked nothing like where I grew up. I thought I knew my homeland back to front, but it turns out that I didn't. Maddox's work tossed me out to sea, giving me the same view that my convict ancestors must have had when they first sighted Tasmania. The title of Maddox's work, Terra Spiritus, contradicts the assumption of Terra Nullius, the idea that this land was uninhabited before white settlement. And she goes further by naming the places depicted using two scripts, 
the European names printed in letterpress and the Aboriginal names handwritten in cursive above. For me, this complex and mystical work is a profound and symbolic statement about coexistence. And by including the indigenous names of the topographical features, Maddock reminds us that this land had previous owners. And for a Tasmanian, that's a fact that's all too easily forgotten. This is a painting by John Glover, depicting Aboriginal people near a river. And this is John Glover. And this is John Glover's house. John Glover was one of the first free settling artists to move to Australia. He chose to come here. Even more incredible was that he chose to come to Tasmania. He must have seen one of those Joseph Lysons and thought, oh yeah, that looks all right, I'll go there. John Glover is considered to be the grandfather of Australian landscape painting, and he looks well able to take that on the chin. The work of John Glover lines the gallery walls in Launceston, Hobart, and many on the mainland. And they line my memory too. When I was younger, I became obsessed with these rubbery gum trees. I thought they were at once beautiful and ridiculous. Unlike Joseph Lysett, Glover shows real affection for his new home. He closely observed the idiosyncrasies of the Tasmanian landscape and its light. Glover liked to paint Aboriginal Arcadias, showing a people untouched by Western civilization, a happy existence. A great example of that is this work, The Bath of Diana. I genuinely love this painting, but like the images of Lysett, Glover edited out some pretty serious truths, which to my eye, give it a rather troubling quality. For one thing, it would have been impossible for Glover to witness scenes such as this. You see, by the time Glover settled, Tasmania had been at war. Pastoralists could not and would not coexist with the indigenous population, and the result of that war was the decimation of Tasmanian Aboriginal culture. This is artist Julie Goff. She's a Tasmanian Aboriginal woman. And like Daniel Boyd and Joan Ross, her work deals with the scar tissue of history. I was curious to know what she thought of John Glover and his depictions of Tasmanian Aboriginals. First question, are you a fan of John Glover? Yeah, there's precious few works depicting Tasmanian Aboriginal people at that period. And they are really problematic, but they give us another kind of window into what was happening and it really raises questions about why he persisted in adding Aboriginal people to his paintings. Glover seemed unable to paint Tasmanian Aboriginals as a people under attack. Apparently, he was nostalgic for some kind of past he had not experienced. At the same time as he painted these Aboriginal Arcadias, he painted pastoral Arcadias. These show his home and surrounding lands free of Aboriginal presence and filled with the promise of a bright new future for Team Glover. Only on one canvas did Glover depict the collision of Aboriginal and settler history. Hobart Town seems to be in a better light. I think that's what he's saying, is that white man's the future and this is the dusk. Do you think Glover thought of it as a memorial piece? Well, he knew what was happening, which was over the 30 years preceding his arrival, around 5,000 people have all but disappeared. The people that he's mixing with are the people responsible. These Glovers are held at the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra. Julie Goff has a piece of her own work on display here. It speaks directly to the violence between the Tasmanian colonists and Aboriginal people. But it is exhibited downstairs in the Indigenous Gallery, in what could be seen as a rather deliberate separation of one history from another. You've ruined this piece of furniture, haven't you? Yeah, some would say, <laughs> some would say, but I see it as my duty to modify and remodel and bring out the past in new ways. So furniture sometimes works really well. It's called the chase? 
Yes. And it's a chase lounge. Uh huh. I see what oh, you've done there. Pun pun. See. Pandemonium. Yeah. <laughs> um, why the chase? On this chase is pins spelling out an actual story from 1830 that was in uh, the Hobart Town Gazette. The news story tells of some Aboriginal people who absconded from their white masters and were subsequently recaptured. By using pins in a lounge chair that may have existed in the period of the story, Julie jogs the memory of our uncomfortable history. I mean, you wouldn't want to sit on it. Like Beermatic, Julie Goff is using text to rewrite the past, to remind us that although colonial art may look cosy and ordered, nothing could be further from the truth. What worries me is that if the past becomes so past that it's forgotten, people can walk around oppressed but not know why. Mm. But we've still got a chance here in Australia to sort it out rather than just be, you know, confused and damaged. So you have to bring it out. Bring it up, yeah. Face it. Vomit it up. I'll vomit it up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. As much as we don't like to admit it, our past does impact on us today. As we've seen, colonial artists tended to paint over what they didn't want to see, but that paint is starting to peel. Contemporary artists like Julie are picking away at it, exposing tensions and opening up new, more confronting dialogue. I'm going to visit another artist who also makes quite the point of questioning history. Hi, Ben. The real Hannah. Hannah, the real one? The real one. Yes. Ben Quilty is probably Australia's most well-known artist working today. Even my mum's heard of him. Ben is fascinated with issues of identity and the way that art can talk to our history. I've come to talk to him about his large-scale Rorschach painting of a local tourist attraction called Fairy Bower Falls, which is the site of a dark and hidden history. Herman Rorschach was a psychoanalyst who was a pioneer of psych medicine. The Rorschach test, if you can see something in it, you show signs of paranoia or delusional behaviour. That was the idea. And they're still used. I can see a uterus in a koala. I'm wondering what Ben's Rorschach will say to me. So the idea of Rorschach is really just to confront the audience and in one, one sense make them think about what a raw shark is and then to make them consider that I've done that with a landscape and that there is something to look at and that there is things to talk about and that there's a whole lot of stuff that needs to be discussed about the way we interact with this country. So you found this particular site uh, that you live near? Yeah, so there's this oral history of this site in Bundanoon that's uh, very, very beautiful and there's photos with parasoled women and top-hatted men enjoying this beautiful landscape. And we also go and enjoy this beautiful landscape and this very sort of magical, hidden, mossy green waterfall. But there's also this history of a horrendous massacre there of a lot of Aboriginal people. And the Gundungurra tribe of this area literally disappeared. The men were away on initiation ceremony and so the women and children were here. These two young men came here with their rifles. Although there's no real written record of what happened in this spot, there is written records right across the country of where these things happened. Well, it is part of the cathartic process, I suppose. In more recent history, the massacre at Port Arthur, it was immediately recognised and it's part of the site now. And, and I think that it's a positive thing to put the commemorative plaque in a place like this, so that it's a place of reflection as well. And it makes us as a country acknowledge the truth of, of these beautiful places. You have a nice lifestyle. Yeah and yet you're living amongst this history. Yeah. How do you kind of reconcile that? Well, you know, I, I, um, I can't. It's hard to reconcile that. It's a confronting thing and it has made it part of my work. And that's how I reconcile it, through my work. Do you feel a sense of this spectre of white guilt? Yeah, of course. Absolutely, it's massive. I mean, I remember social studies in year four started when Cook walked onto the land. That's the history of Australia. Hang on a sec, what, what, am, what are we learning here? The story about this painting is not about 
the Indigenous people, it's about my experience of being, you know, nine-tenths Irish man living in someone else's country and loving this place, being interested in the history and responding to that. There's nothing to say that it's not a beautiful landscape and that was important for me. It is a beautiful place, but when you realise what it's actually about, it's a haunting landscape as well, a haunted landscape. John Glover's visions of Tasmania are beautiful, but they are devoid of scar tissue. When I used to look at these paintings, I'd take them at face value and think of them as celebrations of gentle labour and tranquility. But now that I know more about our history and art, I can't help but look at these and hopelessly count the cost of this ideal and my own place within it. I think it's important and healing that Australian artists of today are willing to tell the untold stories and confront the leftover tensions of our colonial past. Because like Dorothy, I don't want to live in a dream Oz, a forgery made up of myth and ignorance. I want home to be a real life place. Only then can we go forward and feel like we really belong. In the next episode, we move to Federation and the genesis of Australia's obsession with its hyper-masculine identity. So, with the help of some early 20th century female painters, as well as some contemporary artists, I want to see if I can uncover an alternate portrait of a more ladylike Australia.